I'm starting out today at Deuteronomy chapter 1 in verse 6. The Lord our God spoke to us in Horeb. Take your journey and go to the mountains of, Amor of the Amorites, to all the neighboring places in the plain, in the mountains, and in the lowland, in the south, the sea coast, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. See, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them and their descendants after them. So he said to them, you've dwelled on this mountain for so long. You've been on this mountain for so long. And he said, take your journey going to all the mountains as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. He said, because the land has been set before you and it is time to go and possess uh, the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. And scriptures began to give us a, prof a prophetic profiling of the land that God had set before the people of Israel, to which he said, it is now time to go and take. In Deuteronomy 7, he started to declare, the Lord your God, when he brings you into the land which you go out to possess, and has cast out many nations before you, and he started to describe these nations, he said, seven nations greater and mightier than you, and when the Lord your God delivers them on over to you, you shall conquer them utterly and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them nor show them mercy. And he started to describe the land. He said, you are God's holy people. He's chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples of the earth. He said, the Lord didn't set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the people, for you were the least of all the peoples. But, the, but because the Lord loves you and because he will keep the oath which he saw to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he said he keeps covenant. He's a faithful God. He shows mercy to a thousand generations. He said he will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will bless the fruit of your womb. He wasn't just talking to his people in Israel. He's talking to you today. Hallelujah. So receive that into your heart. He said he will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will bless the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your land, your mind, your grain. You're blessed above all the people's. And he said, there will be no male or female barren amongst you. He said, he'll take away sickness and you will not be afflicted with the terrible diseases of the Israelites. He said, you'll deliver kings into their hands and you will not destroy, you will destroy their name under the heaven. I just want to, I want your heart to burn within you. He started to speak to them in verse 8. The land I am bringing you into is a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains, of springs that flow out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land in, in which you will eat your bread without scarceness, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron, out of whose hills you can dig copper. Wow! He said, when you have eaten and are full, you will bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. This was the destiny of the children of Israel. Hallelujah. God transitioned them out of slavery into enthronement. He transitioned them out of scarcity into abundance. He transitioned them out of fear into faith. The design and the desire of God was to place them where he saw them. Many times, the aspiration of man is to place himself where he sees himself. The desire of God is to place you where he sees you. And no matter how clear and powerful the image you carry in your heart concerning your future is, there are still realms that seem unfathomable to you but exist as a small thing in the mind of God concerning you. Hallelujah. And so this is the children of Israel. They had experienced enslavement. Their neck had been bowed. They had labored under yokes. They knew what it felt like to deploy their talent, their brains, their expertise, the human capital what it felt like to live their lives without freedom they didn't have their they didn't own their time they didn't own their energy 
they didn't own their talent they didn't own their resources they were distressed constantly pain when the Lord said liberty is now say liberty is now a day came when the Lord said I will bring you out so that I can take you in I will cause you to experience supernatural upsurge I'll bring you into increase I'll bring you into abundance I'll bring you into rest of soul I'll bring you into destiny I'll bring you into divine design according to my original plans for your life and by himself through what is called the navigation system of the spirit God started to reroute them for destiny and the beautiful thing about the navigation system of the spirit is that no matter how far you have gone on the wrong direction you can be rerouted to God's perfect plans for your life the beautiful thing about the navigation system of the spirit is if you are already going on the right path God can accelerate and give you speed say I receive speed in the spirit two people can be going on the right path to a definite destination but their speed can be significantly different so God is giving you both direction and he's also giving you velocity in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ you have speed in the right direction and we are in this hour where the Lord says to declare boldly to you that things that eyes have never seen, things that ears have never heard, things that have never entered into the hearts of men are the things he's doing at the close of the age. And you are going to be God's public announcement system. You are going to be God's public address system. God's glory is going to look so good on you that you will become a well-documented case study of what God can do with a yielded vessel. That's the hour we're in. The leadership of this house are spot on prophetically concerning the, the, the theme that this media conference carries. When the hour for those who believe to see the outstretched arm of God most high. Scripture says that the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro the earth looking for those whose hearts are perfect toward him that he might show himself strong on their behalf that he might show himself strong on their behalf. Look at the children of Israel. They were coming from low income living. They were the, they were the, on the lowest rung of the food chain. A people without class, a people without passport, a people without audacity, a people without a voice. Hallelujah. And then God, transition them into destiny he said I'm bringing you into a good land a land flowing with milk and honey now that promise is already powerful but think about the people concerning whom God was doing it these were people who didn't have access to milk didn't have access to honey didn't have access to pomegranate or olive oil hallelujah but he said, I'm bringing you into a good land, a land flowing with milk and honey, with barley and wheat, pomegranate, olive oil, a land in which you will eat your bread without scarceness and your waters will not fail. Guess what? If you go further in that scripture, it actually says to them, I'm bringing you into houses you didn't build. I'm bringing you into cities you didn't construct orchards you didn't plant wells you didn't dig and he said I'm doing this for you not because story and your past what God wants to birth in your future what God wants to create next in your life is not a continuation it's not an arithmetic progression you are going to be so blown over by how radically you will be shifted into destiny that you will tell your story of where you're coming from to some believers and they will need faith to believe you why is God doing this it's not because you are the nicest 
in case you have an emotional relationship with God and your understanding of favor is that God is going to handpick eight of us out of all of us, then he would so praise in the way we operate church, in the way we operate local assemblies. You know why? We invite people to share their testimonies. And when they share their testimonies, we start to look at them as having something we don't have. Is that correct? Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever sown a seed to covet the grace of God on the life of someone else? The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. There's a just administration of God's grace over all of us. So why is God doing this? God is doing this not, not really because you, you are that spiritual. He's doing this because it is the allocation of God over a generation. We are the tipping point generation. We are the ones concerning whom the scripture speaking through the Lord Jesus Christ declared that I will bring you into the harvest. The corruption in our time is grave. The pain and the poverty is grave. If we are going to tackle the suffering, we need consulting for government that is negotiating the destiny of the vast womb of your spirit with prophet kept secret. No more. It is a disservice to the kingdom for you to be broke, busted, and disgusted. It doesn't favor you and it doesn't favor the kingdom. Your voice must be heard. You must use business. Rokoto boto koya badi andosa bad roads. Ekrokoto lianda health centers that don't work. Mikuri looks like we will be playing, and it's possible some people are sat looking up to. He said, "Upon those who dwelt in darkness, a great light now shines. A day comes when light shines. Eyes so that's your destiny." And you have to hunger and thirst for it. When the tipping point hour, if we are going to cover grounds, because we've lost grounds when we were sleeping. We've spent so many years sleeping. We only really used intercession and spiritual agreement to pray for church expansion, to pray for promotions at work, visa to Canada and the UK, Building your own house in a gated estate, changing your cars and sending your children to premium schools. We've wasted the time and we have lost ground. But God is saying, if I find a people who will arise, who will understand the purpose of prosperity, if I find a people upon whom I can rest the burdens of government and I can exalt into leadership and influence, who will use their voice to amplify the truth? Who will use abundance and wealth to lift the needy and the vulnerable in society? Who will long and press to enter encounters? Because when we talk about the tipping point generation, we are not just talking about a people whose bank accounts will be fattened. He has given us access to dimensions of his person. It's the blessing of the final hour. Because even the ability to preach the gospel by the help of the Holy Spirit has to take on more dexterity, more creativity. There are people who listen to me now who wouldn't have listened to me maybe five years ago. Amen. God wants to accelerate you. God wants to elevate you. God, they have to mark you and will still be speaking a decade to come. And I pray for you in the name of Jesus that you will hear for destiny. Yes, indeed. That God can take a nameless minority from the back end of nowhere and place them before world leaders and presidents, not as an onlooker, 
or someone seeking to take a nice picture to upload on their Instagram because we are busy doing nonsense. But as a voice that is reckoned with, behind closed doors, where I'm being asked, what do you say is the roadmap for fixing the continent of Africa? And today in two African countries, I'm negotiating policy outcomes that in the course of this decade can bring poverty down by at least 12%. What, are, what burns in your heart? What do you see as possible? Today God is going to put in your heart a new understanding of who you could become that will really shift you from the problematic paradigms you have been carrying. Every identity distortion will be pulled down by the influence of the word of God. In the name of Jesus Christ. I want to show you a few things. If a people, a generation, a person, a family, an assembly will transition into enthronement, will accelerate into advancement. By the way, before I continue, can we just establish and settle it once and for all? Is there anyone in this room who believes they are in a place or space in their lives too bad that God cannot fix? Now, done with this meeting. The activation of the Holy Ghost will cause your eyes to begin to see the largeness of your God. There was a man. They took the Ark of the Covenant to him because he was the dejected of society. They were so terrified of what God had done while Uzziah tried to defend the Ark from falling that they looked around and they said, who does it not matter if he was killed by the Ark? They looked at a person who didn't have such relevance to society, to the militia, the government, the commerce, if he's wiped. In honor of housing the presence of God, scripture says in three months, everything changed. Changed. It's the power of the blessing. It's the power of the blessing. The blessing is a supernatural obligation to prosper against all odds. So God will cause your eyes to begin to see what he can do when he steps into the situation of an ordinary person. And from that moment, as the spirit of faith is awakening in you, you see your heart being lifted out of doubt, of fear, of pain. Absolutely nothing impossible for a God. If a people will transition and enter into what the Lord has promised, if a generation, a nation, a family, an individual, a government, a destiny under God, will accelerate into influence and affluence, supernatural increase that break protocols and don't make sense in the natural progression of time. If a people will enter into their divine destiny and be enthroned in the arenas of grace and glory under God, there are protocols. There are protocols of the blessed life. And I'm going to take you into numbers. We will touch on very quickly a few of these thoughts. I'm going to ask you when we are done and we go home that you sit with Deuteronomy and numbers. Numbers start from 10, take it on to 16. I believe that the Lord will enlighten your heart greatly. And he will put in your hands specific instructions. As you listen today and even after we leave here, I want you to hunger and thirst for a specific instruct. That God, a word that is my word will come to me. Something I must do because faith is an action. Faith is the action you take in the direction of the future God has for you. 
And so we didn't just come to be inspired. We came to take definitive steps in the direction of destiny. Do you understand this? Things are really spiritual. Things are really spiritual. I've gone to some nations receiving clear instructions to place my feet on those territories and declare things. Months down the line, in some cases years down the line, that entire nation opens up supernaturally as though of its own accord, offering me pros prophetic processions that are not only putting governmental influence in my hands, but also granting me access to negotiate outcomes impacting the majority. Offering me opportunities to do business in thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars by the spirit. But we want to learn how to trade Bitcoin. Nothing wrong with it. But, you know, Pastor already said it, and I'm taking that away. So powerful. You can't go set yourself into destiny. We need a word from the Lord. Every time that you receive a word from the Lord, and you begin to layer principles, divine instructions, specific steps, upon that word from the Lord, you are turning your life into a warehouse and an unstoppable factory of the supernatural life. Here are a few things that the Lord highlighted very strongly for me to bring to your attention as protocols, protocols for supernatural advancement, protocols for supernatural increase, things he would love us to pay attention to so that we can be a generation that will not die in the wilderness. So we can be a generation that enters into the promise and enters into the promise fast. Hallelujah. In Numbers 11, look at what's happening here. When the people complained, it displeased the Lord for he heard it and his anger was aroused. So the fire of the Lord burned among the people and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and when Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire was quenched. So he called the name of the place Tabera, because the fire of the Lord had burnt amongst them. Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish we ate freely in Egypt. The cucumbers, the melon, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic but now our whole being is dried up. There's nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. The first key warning that the Lord has given me to bring to you as a people pressing into the promise, going on into the inheritance is the problem of pleasure. The problem of pleasure is an ongoing assailing. It's a satanic siege against this generation. Scripture says that intense craving fell upon the mixed multitude amongst them and the children of Israel latched onto that craving and began to cry. Who is going to give us meat to eat? When we were in Egypt, when we were in slavery, we had cucumbers, onions, garlic, leeks. But now all that is before our eyes is this manna and they cried out. Guess what they said? They said in the absence of cucumbers, onions, garlic, leeks, our whole bin has dried up. We have an unhealthy exaggeration of our needs. Our whole bin, my soul, my spirit, all of a sudden, because I don't have this. And you see, there are people who don't come to church again because God failed them. How did God fail them? They didn't pass icon the second time. God failed them. After all these years of, how did he fail them? They are 32 and they are still not married. We have an exaggeration of our needs. 
And if you are going to journey with the Lord and he will entrust prosperity with you, 100%, let me make an announcement. You'll be tested with inadequacy. You'll be tested with needs that persist without being met. You'll be tested with financial challenges. Mm. Because we can't put prosperity in your hands until we have killed your desire for it. There is a painful, dreadful problem of uh, pleasure in our generation. And it is heightened by what your robust call Shagbe Loju Yoyu. Selah. Selah. Who wants to say it with me, Shagbe? Loju Yoyo. Okay, you, you guys all came from UK for this conference. <laughs> so you don't know what I'm talking about. Shagbe Loju Yoyo is the phenomenon where people pursue gold. Whereas what they are chasing is costume jewelry. It's fancifully packaged, but there's no substance there. Social media is a tool of pursuing non-substantial, non-essential nonsense because it's nicely packaged. You are stressed because someone... The problem of pleasure. The second thing that is facilitating this, per, this ongoing, I won't call it perpetual because a new generation is arising. But this ongoing crisis is also facilitated by messages in the body that are not Christ-centered. You cannot preach the message of Christ without the message of suffering. You can't preach the message of Christ without the message of the cross. Hallelujah. Not everything that is good for you is sweet. And not everything that is sweet is good for you. There are waiting seasons in God. There are humble beginnings in God. There is process in God. There are experiences that make it. Why has thou forsaken me? Jesus Christ, the second co-equal from the even pastors honor and celebrate the grace of God on people's life when they have material evidence of growth, abundance, and prosperity. Because it makes it look like the anointing is working better. The anointing is not only working when you buy a car. The anointing is working when you sell your car and you trek for a year. It is working. The anointing is not only working when as a sister in choir, a man of God visiting from Germany. As he prayed the way, looked at you said, ah, Korean. And the, the testimony is that, the anointing is also working. You are serving. It's your fourth year. God has a word. You've been stewarding it. You've not seen anything in the environment. He is building character in you. I want him to look at me and to see himself. For that to happen, I have so much jankari work for him to take out. A path of destiny that takes away consecration leads nowhere. The problem of pleasure a whole bin is dried out. I want it, I want it now. So people will prefer to stay in enslavement. That's how people stayed in jobs when God gave them a vision. Right? They knew the vision would mean a pay cut. And so they stay there. They stay in that enslavement. A job is not an enslavement if God is there. It is if God is not there. This will not be you in the name of Jesus. My challenge to you is to insist on the joy of the Lord. With joy you will draw from the wells of salvation. Insist on life. No grumbling, no complaining, no heezing, no cursing. Hallelujah. And no hold. I've served God all this while. Sounds out. That is why you could say that. We're not a murmuring people. We're not a grumbling people. We don't grumble. You, you know, some people think in grumbling, it will hasten God. Because that is how you practice parenting, doesn't mean that is how God does it. You know, there are parents who don't like their children to cry. They are quickly trying to, 
don't cry, don't cry, yeah, take it. No, no, you can cry. It, those are powerful learning moments. I asked them, what do you think you can do to make yourself feel better? Ah! <laughs> take it, just take a breath again. <gasps> Sometimes my daughter is acting like she wants to faint. And my younger son, ah! like you have to just save me. No, 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 what can calm you down? I'm, I'm, I'm not moved by crying children. I enjoy it. That's where their best lessons are. And I don't care if you cry in public or private. Because I'm not trying to keep any reputation. You can cry and throw yourself on the floor in a supermarket. I will stand there with you. Show sure, well, okay. Oh yeah, did 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 Yes. So, because we're always trying not to make our children cry, we think when we cry and, and throw tantrums, heaven will start to hold in a board meeting. We have to do something. No! Strengthen your lungs. Even when... We will live in the our, our siblings. We will give thanks. No, we will know the hand of God, so that in due time He will exalt us. If uh, and I'm still really young, I'm still really going far. But what I have found, even in this journey of growing with the Lord, if God didn't do some things in the womb of my spirit, producing character, I've seen some access to important personalities, access to to a, a degree of wealth. That if that work wasn't done, one would have been in trouble. Yes. The prosperity of fools would destroy them. So says the scripture. The pro problem of pleasure. If we're going to be a people, Lord, to hurry out of the path God is leading us into. Because we just want to aspire to perspire to Maguire. Say that's not me in the name of Jesus. Say that's not me in the name of Jesus. I can't hear you say that's not me in the name of Jesus. A second thing I want to draw your highlight to is what, to the sons. Uh, to call highlight here is, is, is to understand the purpose of prophetic order. The purpose of prophetic order. This is going to be critical to lead you into what God has for you. God leads men by the prophetic. God raises men by the prophetic. Beyond your natural ability, your expertise, your degrees, there is the force of the divine decree. God raises men by supernatural encounters. God gives them, God can give a man speed that outruns the chariots, train the chariots. There's the supernatural. There's promotion in the supernatural. There's a thing as divine lifting. And God has protocols and orders that he sets for men to be lifted. By the way, when God wants to lift a man, God introduces a man. And you might be seated... There's nobody like that here. I know there are people that I have met over the years who say, if God wants to do it, he will do it for me. No, he doesn't live in your realm. You are blessed through men. Hallelujah. The gift of men and the gifts that men give. Hallelujah. So the principles of divine lifting are significantly connected to prophetic orders. That's why he sets the soul literary in families. That's why he raises you in the midst of a people. That's why he leads men and he leads armies by prophets. Hallelujah. In the days of old, when the, the armies of the Roman Empire, the Israelites, right? When they want to go to war, they would have their military strategy. They would have their reinforcements. They would have their militia mapping. They would have their weaponry and armory. Yet, they will go to the prophet of the Lord to say, shall we advance or not? Is that correct? Ige, why? I just came back from Cambridge and we know how we do it. Okay. No, 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 Emalo. Yeah. Have you not seen men who don't have a degree? And who sit over multinationals, having those with the degrees answering to them. The mysteries of the earth, the mysteries of the kingdom. Miriam said this, and it's the very same thing that Korah and his team said. 
Miriam said in, in Numbers 12, 2, has God indeed spoken only to Moses? Has he not also spoken through us? I hear God too. It's one of the most dangerous things, especially for the spiritually mature. Hallelujah. No matter how high you rise in your walk with God, keeping a posture of humility, knowing those he has raised over you, voices, teachers, mentors, fathers, spiritual leaders, is a powerful protocol to advance your cause and destiny. 2019, I sat under one of my mentors, a powerful prophet of God. And she placed her hands on me, started to pray. Her hands were burning. She said, get me the oil, get me the oil. She said, I'm going to anoint you into a new realm of wealth. That year, I did about 12 times what my previous annual income was in three months. I didn't introduce a new product or service. I was doing exactly what I was doing, but my, my, my name started to billow across cities and continents. Do you understand this? I, I had a skelter literally asking God for a strategy to expand our business model. The force of the prophetic, the force of the anointing. The highest strategy is also scripture to cry out to the Lord, please heal her, oh God, I pray. She was shot out of the camp seven days and the people could not drink fathers in our generation. Don't let that be you. Don't trivialize the spiritual. Don't commonize the holy. Don't make jokes about the things of the spirit. Amen and amen. amen. And if you find your heart starting to get maybe a bit confused about the doctrines of our faith, then you make it your project. If somewhere in your heart you're actually like, and what's even the big deal about this whole tithing and seed sowing and what's all these things? Don't joke with it. These are the things that firmly establish us in the faith. So if you're not clear about the doctrines of our faith, then you go and get Kenneth Hagin Bible study manuals. You see, this is how we really grow. We grow when we create development plans based on the gaps we observe in our spiritual journey. Do you understand this? So if people are reading the Bible and using amazing, amazing grace, so great devotional, you will know that's not what you need. Or our daily bread. You know that's not what you need because you understand where you are and what God is calling your attention to. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to leave you with one more. And it's because it centers everything we've spoken about. And I'm going to give us a chance to pray together. God is going to blow, you know, he's going to, uh, there's, there's a word in my spirit. He's going to billow over you. That's it. You would hear the sound of the father like the sound of many waters. He'll billow over you. You'll walk out of this room with conviction, knowing that God wants to do a new thing with you. And you're going to cooperate with that journey in the name of Jesus Christ. In Numbers 13, allow me to show you something rather defining. In verse 26 of Numbers 13, now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word from the Lord. Now, the beginning is that God said to Moses in verse 1, send men to spy the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the children of Israel. And, and Moses sent them out. He said, go check the land out, whether it's good or bad. Check the cities if they are inhabited like camps or strongholds. Check whether the land is rich or poor and whether there are forests there or not. Be then he said, send out spies to go look at the land. Go research the land. Go check it out. God has put a vision in some of your hearts and you're already doing your research. Am I correct? You're buying business reports. You're looking at this thing and saying, how would this thing be? What would our penetration strategy be? What would our go-to market plan be? How do we make this work? Because this is what God has told us. Ministries should do it as well. You traverse the length and the breadth, the tangents and the, and the altitudes of, of a city in prayer, knowing what God has said to you about the city. So this is an age-long 
kingdom strategy here. And so God sent them out. When they went out, this is what they said to Moses. We went to the land you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are very strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land, and uh, Can Canaanites by the sea along the banks of John, uh, Jordan. Caleb quieting the people before Moses, and he said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. Isn't this the power of faith? Faith does not denounce the presence of the opposition. Faith does not denounce the presence of the obstacle. But faith says what we have on our inside is greater than what they've got on their inside. He said, let's go up at once because we're well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to come up against the people for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report. The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that divorces its inha inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. They, there we saw giants and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so were we in their sight. This is the pro poison of problematic paradigms. Again, a strong warfare against anyone, any nation, any people, any generation, any family, any government pressing into supernatural advancement. Hallelujah. What changes your life? It's not what you hear in this conference. What changes your life is what you believe about what you hear in this conference. Our lives are constantly auto-correcting to the level of our most predominant belief systems. So there's always this auto-correcting going on. People scream in these meetings, they are inspired and they are motivated. But as you go back, thoughts like, well, that was, it was inspiring, you know, ah, more ginger, no double, or more reality still do. She gets, she gets, that, that's that lady, ah, one more red, one year gets. She's having that kind of ginger within her. But our <laughs> lamo, you know, we know how streets they. <laughs> Say, that's not me. If God can get his vision into your heart, the possibilities of the kingdom have entered into your life. When he came to the earth realm, the summary of the message of Jesus was, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. You know why? Because repent is not turned from your wicked ways. That's what, that is one of the most theologically mishandled word in scripture. Repent is not stop doing bad things. It's not turned from your wicked ways. Repent is make a radical departure from present thinking. It's metanoia. Metanoia. A shift in paradigm. That's repentance. Because if you see differently, you will be differently. Hallelujah. This is about the arena of the biggest attack of the enemy against the body of Christ. You see, if I had that opportunity, I would have taken you to one of the famous scriptures on faith. When he started to say, you will say unto this mountain. When you pray, because when you pray is different from what you say. If what you say does not match what you pray, you won't see the transformation you're seeking in your life. People pray a thing and they say another right what you say is the true reflection of the state of your mind as i leave you today i want to challenge you i want to call you and i want to invite you to a journey of a paradigm shift i want you to i want to invite you to a journey of mental deliverance mental encounters and mental reclamation
I want you to hunger and thirst with all your heart that the Bible will become the yardstick for your decisions. I want to challenge you to begin to believe with all your heart and begin to alter your position and opinion based on what God is saying about you. Stop listening to the streets. That's not how we live. So if the word of God, the vision of God, and what he is saying and doing in our time does not begin to reframe our mental uh, paradigms, there is no way we can enter into what he has for us. If I had the opportunity to do a just treatment of the problematic paradigms, I would have shown you seven within this particular scripture. But a few things should jump out at you. God gave a word, a promise, yet the people said, we are not able to take the land. Why? Because we think that it relies on our natural ability to accomplish the vision of God for our lives. He gave the word. You see, they didn't go back to say, we saw all these giants and we were so terrified. You know, the problem is not that they were terrified. I hope you know that. The problem is that they drew conclusions based on their fear. Right? Faith is choosing a higher edit, but they didn't believe he could do it. A second thing that should truly trouble you is that they said the great conclusions in the favor of negativity. Every time that you say those kind of things, ah, may Nigeria not happen to you. This country ought to finish. You can't say that. You can't. And the third thing they live about yourself is what you project and you begin to see others looking at you that way. Have you noticed? You get into a room, you feel like people are just acting cold. But you're the one who is feeling that way about yourself. Feeling like you've not been received, you've not been loved. I, hallelujah, I expect to be favored. I expect to be spotted, highlighted for good. Happens everywhere. I expect it so much that sometimes I have to hide. Because his glory looks good on me. It actually looks very good on me. I'm going to leave you with this word. Let me tell you how God promotes a man. God, and they become obligated to honor you and to show you kindness. It's not for those who hold mics. It's for anybody who believes. Guess what? I had a friend who was not a believer when I was on campus. Systems. He would be like, I know to get money. And in fact, my papa know, you know, they know to hold back. But I go pay my school fees. Just to watch me. No man now. God now, papa now. I'm not kidding. He wasn't a born again Christian at the time. I pray he's now because I always pray to him. He was my friend. He was super smart. So we read together a lot. He'll be like, I know to hold bar. But wait, I, he will be like, my papa know to hold bar. But God now, my, now my papa. He'll say, just to watch me now. The ego sort, normal, that one are normal. He never was sent out of school for school fees. The one that fascinates me more, he will be like, oh my, I, I they hung. You go see now, somebody go buy him donuts, just a watch. That one are normal. God go favor me. They go just look me like me. It never failed. I'm not joking. People will come to guy, Emmanuel, you want, you look at me like, I don't, I don't, I don't know, man, I tell you this thing. I tell you, I tell you this thing. Again and again. We traveled on a field trip. We were in a bus together. So I bowed my head to pray, Father, thank you, you know, praying for the trip. So I looked at him. I was like, you know, even pray. He said, you, where you they pray? Why you they pray? You they fear now. Now why you they pray? Me, as I did, I know, say, God, uncover all of us. And his, his whole life, throughout our six years together on campus, was shaped significantly positively. It's a difference between the older brother and the younger brother. The older brother was in the house, his heart was in the field. The younger brother was in the field, his heart was in the house. When his heart connected with what God was doing, he came back home. And when he came back home, the heart of the older brother was exposed that it had always been in the field. 
He never really trusted the Father. He never really knew the love of the Father. He never really believed in the Father. He never saw the Father. He never saw that everything the Father has was his. Right? Don't be the older brother. Go fix your paradigm. Today as we rise, I want you to lift your hands and say, Lord, help my mind. I receive new belief systems in the Holy Ghost. Rabba koto bele gadeberu sabande. Leko shataba dibaha. I'm calling you to pray with more intensity. If the Lord can call you out of problematic thinking, he can bring you in to a powerful vision. I want you to cry out and say, help my mind. Give me new thinking. Elevate my perspective. Teach me how to see myself and how to see the world.
to pray for people who have received a vision for the next generation. You can sense a teaching, mentoring, anointing for the next generation. Some of you have a campus assignment. You see God calling you to young people. Please lift your hands. Thank you, Lord. God is causing a generation of younger people to gravitate in your direction so that you can raise them for destiny. Let the gates of secondary schools open up. Let the gates of polytechnics open up. Let the gates of colleges of education open up. Let the gates of vocational institutes open up. Oh, thank you, Lord. Let the gates of universities open up. The ministry, every ministry gift. Can you lift your hands? Every ministry gift. The Lord says to me to tell you that it's the hour of fine oil. Woo! It's the hour of fine oil. Yes, 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 yes. Unprecedented dimensions of the anointing resting upon you now, upon you now. Yes, 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 Lord. very quickly is to call you into the grace of giving. It takes grace to give at the level that can trigger dimensions in the realm of the spirit. If you desire that, if you desire that, it's not for everybody, but you desire that, you want the Lord to gift you with a great grace to give generously to kingdom agenda, to kingdom mission. You're going to see it so pragmatically to change your life. You're just going to see the bowels of compassion rising and things will lose their hold on you. It's a real, real dimension. And it has been a door opener in many, many instances in my life. You want to lift your hands if you're hungry for the gift of giving, a capacity not to withhold anything from the Lord for the sake of the kingdom and for his sons and daughters. Father, pour out upon us a new spiritual generosity. We're not going to eat our seeds in the name of Jesus. Thank you for new spiritual generosity over God's people in this house and everyone who will watch now or later. Pour it out over us, God. A new desire to fund kingdom mission. And thank you for the abundance that is coming into their lives now. In the name of the Lord Jesus, Father, we give you praise. Do you want to rejoice this morning? 